Hello, I'm Ed Close. Do you remember word problems? Well, the universe is the ultimate word problem that physicists try to solve using, among other things, something called the calculus, invented by Newton and Leibniz about 300 years ago. The problem with this is that the calculus of Newton and Leibniz assumes that uh, the measure of things can approach zero infinitely closely. In the real world, however, of quanta, where everything is quantized, this is not true. And the calculus of distinctions corrects this error. Whether you know anything about the calculus of Newton and Leibniz or not, I'm going to ask you to put that everything you think about it in the back of your mind uh, for a little while while I tell you about the calculus of distinctions. The calculus of distinctions incorporates the action of consciousness in observation and measurement. Application of the calculus defines <coughs> excuse me, fundamental processes at a level of logic prior to the development of other mathematical operations. A distinction, the basis of all observations, is a finite region distinguished within the field of consciousness by some property of dissimilarity from its surroundings. In other words, something that makes it stand out from everything else around it. The first distinction for any conscious being, you or me, or anyone else, is the distinction of self from other. And the universe experienced by any conscious being is made up of the distinctions perceived by that being. A distinction is comprised of the relationship between three things, extent, content, and consciousness. And distinctions are represented symbolically as shown on this slide. Um, the little curved line is, tells you that we're talking about a distinction. There's no other um, detail given at that point. If it has something under the curve, that indicates uh, the content of, the, of that distinction. And the little n on the right-hand side represents the number of dimensions. So like if you're looking at something on a, in a plane, then that would be two. And it would be a circle or a line or a square or something on that plane or in that plane. If it's a three-dimensional object, then n would be three. And a would be the content, whether it's uh, matter, energy, or consciousness. Now, there's something called a theory of types that was developed by Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead, um, <clears throat> where they said there are three different types of, of, of uh, statements. They can be true, false, or meaningless. And this would be true whether the statement is made in English or some other language or in mathematics, because mathematics is just a stripped-down version of a uh, verbal statement. So true is represented by one in, uh, say, in computer science, and false is represented by zero. So you have everything can be described in terms of one or zero. And the square root of minus one is considered the meaningless statement or analogous to the meaningless statement in, in uh, Russell's logic and theory of types. Uh, and in, in regular mathematics, it uh, is called imaginary because it can't be plotted in, a, in two dimensions or three dimensions. Now, it's rather unfort unfortunate that uh, historically it was designated as imaginary because uh, the calculus of distinction reveals that the third type is self-referential. So let's look at the right-hand side here of distinctions. Uh, the curve just tells you there's a distinction. So if you have two statements that there is a distinction, it's still just that distinction. In the second one, which is uh, across from false, 
we have a distinction within the distinction, or you can think of it as if the distinction were, for instance, a circle. If we move across the border into that circle, we are recognizing this ding the distinction. If we move out again, then there's no distinction and you have a blank. So it's not the same as zero, but the, it just cancels out. Now the bottom uh, equation represents the self-referential nature that uh, so-called imaginary numbers have in the calculus of distinctions. And uh, so it's, even though it equals the same thing as the one at the top, it's, uh, we would uh, identify it in three dimensions. It's a meaningless statement because it says essentially that uh, zero or nothing or blank equals one. And of course that's not true. But it's self-referential and that's why when you see this in an equation, and it turns out the same is true in mathematics of the normal type. When you see an imaginary number, it means you're talking about an extra dimension. It's an indication of an additional <clears throat> dimension. So Fermat's last theorem applied to the conveyance equation for the combination of two elementary particles in true units tells us that no two quarks can combine to form a third uh, stable particle. But let's talk about true units for a minute. If everything is quantized, then everything is in terms of multiples of a small singular unit. That's what uh, basically we're talking about right now when we mention true units. In the calculus of distinctions, we find that no two uh, symmetric particles composed of true units can combine to form a, a third symmetrical party, particle. But in addition, we also find that if you have three symmetric particles that are identical, in other words, they have the same volume like these three tennis balls, they can't combine to form uh, a symmetric uh, particle, fourth particle. However, if you have three particles and they are of different size, different dimension, it turns out that they can be combined. And this is why you never see quarks in anything but combinations of three. It's because they can combine and form stable spinning particles. Now all of the subatomic particles are spinning at very high rates of speed. Some of the angular velocities approach almost the speed of light. So you can see how they would be destructive uh, and spin out of control if they're not symmetric. If they're you could think of them as being lumpy or having some of the units uh, sticking out and uh, they would wobble and, and throw uh, themselves apart because they're being held together, attracted together by electric and magnetic forces. But with enough spinning and enough force, if they're not symmetric, they're going to fly apart and be unstable. Now, I promised to keep uh, the math to a minimum, but some is necessary to explain the logic of true units, so please bear with me. And I'm using here conventional mathematical symbols because I think it will be understood better. When I learn something or discover something with, uh, with the calculus of distinctions, it's always translatable into uh, regular mathematics, it just reveals things that we don't find, we don't see in regular mathematics because we don't have consciousness involved. So <clears throat> the conveyance expression is a general expression and uh, for specific values of n and m uh, we have specific equations. So for example, when uh, n and m are both equal to 3, this uh, conveyance expression yields uh, x1 cubed plus x2 cubed plus x3 cubed 
equals z cubed. Now the x1, y, x1, x2, and x3, and z all have to be integers if this is going to be the combination of the three uh, elementary particles. So we have to have integer solutions and only integer solutions, but it turns out Fermat's theorem tells us that we can't combine two because uh, if you have x1 cubed plus x2 cubed, it can never equal a z cubed. So that means the two, as we said before, that two particles, symmetric particles, cannot combine to form a third one, but three can. So solutions of this equation uh, give us very handy descriptions of the combination of elementary particles. For example, if we think of them as spheres, now they can be any symmetric particle. They could be uh, what are called regular polyhedrons. They could be cubes, they could be uh, tetrahedrons, and so forth. And this would still work because as they spin, they will, <coughs> uh, spinning very fast, they'll look like spheres. Uh, the top equation here, you'll notice that the 4 thirds pi, which 4 thirds pi r cubed is the formula for the volume of a sphere. Now if it happens to be a sphere, this is what you would have. But notice that the 4 thirds pi cancels out all the way across the equation. You can divide everything by 4 thirds pi and get <clears throat> just uh, r1 cubed plus r cubed 2 cubed plus r3 cubed equals r4 cubed. And uh, this would be true for any shaped, any uh, symmetrically shaped object. There'll be a, what I call a shape factor. If it's a cube, um, <clears throat> it would be one for each one of them. If it's a tetrahedron, it's another constant. But in every case, it cancels out. So we have, we find that there is the first simplest solution to this equation is 3 cubed plus 4 cubed equals 5, up to 3 cubed plus 4 cubed plus 5 cubed equals 6 cubed. Now this means <clears throat> that we can combine um, particles that have 3 true units, 4 and 5, and get one that has uh, the linear measure of 6. So I know that's a little complicated, but it works out, and they're only specific uh, this is, these are called Diophantine equations by mathematicians, and they're only specific solutions that are integer, and uh, they happen to describe combinations of various um, elementary particles. So this becomes very useful when we've converted everything to quantized units, which we're calling true units. In the future videos, <clears throat> we'll explore how the calculus of distinctions and true units apply to atoms, elements, and all structures of the universe, including organic life. And I can tell you, amazing discoveries await, so stay with us. <laughs>